Stay hungry, stay foolish. The old way of treating people at work has failed. Only 30% of employees are engaged in their jobs. And in this fast-paced world, that's just not enough. Today's guest is Deborah Corey. She brings 30 years of experience in HR with senior level roles at Fortune 500 companies like Gap, Honeywell and Merlin Entertainments. She is author of Effective HR Communications and co-author of today's book, The Rebel Playbook for Employee Engagement with co-author Glenn Elliott. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's great to have you on the show. And I'd love before we start, because there's so much in this book, it's got a brilliant framework that you described a little bit about yourself, your background, and your co-author, Glenn Elliott. Yeah, so uh, I'll start with myself. So as you said, I've been doing HR, um, I forgot I wrote 30 years in the book. Usually I only say 20, it doesn't make me sound as old. <laughs> so I've been doing it for uh, for quite a few years now. I've worked for many diverse um, companies from uh, retail to pharmaceutical. Right now I'm in my first technology company. So besides writing, I'm also an HR practitioner. I'm the um, reward director at a company called Reward Gateway. Um, and I have the pleasure of being able to do an, be an HR person, but also to write, to get out there and speak, to do podcasts with you. And, um, and I call it my pay it forward part of my job, which I love just as much as being an HR practitioner. And I wrote this book, which just came out in February. And I wrote it with Glenn Elliott, who was the founder of my company, Reward Gateway. And it was a brilliant partnership because I come from the HR perspective. He comes from an entrepreneur and business leader perspective. So it was a, it was a nice balance, um, lots of good discussions and debates um, throughout writing the book. I have to call this out because you both work for a reward gateway in the same company, but oftentimes books like this can be a bit of a sales pitch of the company. But what I found really refreshing was your distinct independence in this book you kept your independence even the case studies which are are throughout the entire book were great companies including tech and traditional companies you keep that very very independent and separate from reward gateway yeah i'm glad that you noticed that because we did do that intentionally we you know both of us have been working long enough that we've learned so many things along the way and we wanted this to be more of, of exactly that what are the things that we've learned right and wrong along the way and it was actually really hard not to tell our own stories because we had lots of stories about what we've been doing at our company. But again, we wanted to be impartial and just tell as many stories as possible. Actually, there's um, 60 of them in the book. We call the stories plays. So as you said, we tried to have companies of different sizes and shapes. And, and actually, I'm still interviewing people um, because I've just, there's, the world's changing too quickly. So I'm continuing to write plays and posting them on our website so that people can continue on their engagement journey and helping them with this. And that's one of the great things. You actually take a lot of the lessons from the workplace of tomorrow, the, the environment of tomorrow, and the working habits of tomorrow and today, and you marry them with that depth of experience as well. And you call out how things are broken and how indeed you may or some of your colleagues may have used old practices, but have learned so much from the way things have evolved. But it would be great to get into because we have so much to talk about because the framework is fantastic. You call the book The Rebel Playbook, and it would be great to describe a little bit about what that's about. Well, it's interesting because we had a, a long discussion and debate about should we or should we not use the word rebel? Because some people will find that, that word uncomfortable. You know, rebel has some negative connotations. But what we wanted to focus on, we wanted to focus on that that uncomfortable aspect, because if, if we are all going to change, and I say we, because again, I'm an HR person, if we're going to change and do things differently that we've done for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we have to get out of our comfort zone and we have to challenge the status quo and start doing things differently Um it's actually funny because when we'd get to the end of a draft of a chapter, we used to kid and say that if Deborah Corey, traditional HR professional, feels uncomfortable and a little bit queasy to her stomach, then we've done a good job in that chapter. <laughs> and if I'm not feeling uncomfortable, well, then we need to go back and push the boundaries a little bit more. Brilliant. And I suppose one of the things to call out is that so many people and leadership consultants are talking about this for a very long time. And it seems that more than ever, because we're in this knowledge economy, 
we have to lead by example. We have to put in the right culture and the right environment for people to succeed because it's the differentiator between companies today. It is definitely. And, you know, I know everybody's heart is in the right place and we all want to change things. But the challenge, I mean, you said the number 30 percent at the beginning. It's not a big number and it's only changing at most one percent a year. And if we really want our businesses to thrive and to succeed, that's just not quick enough. We don't have the luxury of taking a long time and analyzing the problem and trying to figure out what to do. We need to be more agile. We need to be able to just get out there and try different things. You talk about what you call the engagement gap. So the employees versus the CEOs, the the different contexts, they look at the problem. And oftentimes leadership and companies think their employees are engaged and employees think the leadership is totally disengaged. And you call this the engagement gap. Definitely. I mean, the good news is that for leaders, it's on their radar now. So if I remember 10, 15 years ago, I'd have to sit around the table with my leaders and try to convince them of this touchy feely and employee engagement. But the good news is now that they believe that it's critical to the success of their company, the Harvard Business Review did a report where 71% of leaders said it was critical to their success. But then only 24 of them, 24% of them actually felt that their employees were engaged. So you're right, that's the gap between what the businesses are saying that they need and what they're getting. And we see that over and over again when we see studies where we look at what are businesses saying they need and then you survey your employees and there's this huge gap between that. So a lot of our listeners would be CEOs, a lot of executive directors and high level, senior level employees. And one of the things that it's kind of like innovation and one of the problems with an innovation role is that it means something different to everybody. And it's the same, I find, with engagement. I don't know if you find that, but it'd be great to get your definition with your vast experience with these top-level companies. What does an engaged employee look like or feel like or what are they feeling? Yeah, and you are right. Everybody defines it differently. And to be honest with you, some people actually don't even use the word employee engagement anymore. Some people are using employee experience. I don't really care what people call it. Um, We just need to do something about it. But the three ways that we define it in the book, and the first is that they understand and believe the direction of the company and that they understand how they fit in. So it's all well and good to have things in in front of you knowing where the company wants to go, but you need to know where you fit in. And then the last one is that they genuinely want their organization to succeed. And you can see that, you know, you go into, let's just take a retail shop because that's easy. You can go into a retail shop and you can feel, you can, you can see the difference in people who are engaged because they really understand how they're making a difference and they're doing everything they can to make their company successful. Can you tell I was in retail for 15 years? <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's also, though, you, and you talk about this at the start, there is a massive financial impact, a, a happiness impact for the company because the engaged employee is willing to give more, so the customer actually feels that. What kind of organizational impacts can we feel from an engaged workforce? Well, that's the great thing about employee engagement now is that there's more data, which is why our leaders now want it. So some of the data, I mean, there's lots out there, but the, the ones that I use quite often um, are that engage, companies with engaged workforces can have two times higher profit. I've even seen three times, but I don't use that one very often. Um, 21% more productive. Um, even things like lower absence, lower accidents, less errors. Because again, if you think about it, that person, they know what they need to do. So they're not making mistakes. They're more productive. They're not bimbling around. I just did talk the other day and I was talking about bimble monsters because the person's like in a maze, not knowing which direction they're bumping into walls. So it's no surprise that if you're engaged and you, you know, you fit that definition that you are more productive and your company is more successful. You talk about as well, I love what you say. You say a happy employee is not the same as an engaged employee because somebody could be happy because they're getting away without doing very much. It'd be great to give <laughs> uh, an explanation of that. Well, I mean, if you just go back to my my definition about it's more business oriented. So a happy person, you're right, is going around very happy. They're enjoying what they're doing. And don't get me wrong. Most of the time, I'd like to think that an engaged employee is happy. But if you're engaged, you could have some really difficult, challenging situations. Let's go back to that, that retail person again. You know, you're an engaged employee. You're committed to the success of your organization. And then this difficult customer comes along. 
It might not be the most pleasant experience for you, but you're going out of your way to do everything to turn that situation around and you're still an engaged employee. So I don't think that the two always marry up and I think it's a really important distinction. So I'm, I'm glad that you raised that. Brilliant, because I, what I wanted to do is I almost give everybody an idea of what good looks like or what excellent looks like, because now you have a brilliant framework. And, and what I love is it must have taken you so long to get to the simplicity, the engagement bridge, because it's built in such a way that it caters for everything. And oftentimes you see lots of service providers thinking about one or two parts of the bridge, but you've built a bridge with a really solid foundation. It'd be great to share the engagement bridge with our listenership. Well, first of all, I'm glad that you said that because I, I did another talk once where I talked about how, you know, people always say, you know, these, these three easy steps to become engaged or these five things that you can do. And um, I've been doing HR long enough to know that, first of all, it's not easy um, and also that there's no perfect model. So we've created this model and it's something that's evolved. So I can't take credit for it. It's Glenn Elliott, my co-author, who really started doing building this bridge over the years when I joined and we started working together we added a few more elements to it but it really was his brainchild and it's to be honest it's common sense if I when I do talk sometimes I ask people what are the things that you do in your organization to engage your employees and they are the 10 elements of the bridge you might use different words but they they are 10 um, and the reason we use the whole idea of a bridge is I, I don't know about you but I like something visual and if you think about a bridge, it's what help, it helps connect you to your employees. So it's all the things that are going to build that connection, that relationship. And if you only do one of them, yes, that helps people. You know, a few people might get over. But the more planks, the more elements of the bridge that you stack on top of it, the stronger it gets and also the more durable it gets. And then the last thing I'd say about it is that everybody builds it in their own way. So one company might decide that they're going to build one plank really big under one area. Another might focus on another. And I think that's really key because it is not a black and white model. Everybody needs to assess and build it and be the architects of their own bridge. Yeah, I suppose that when they're all involved as well, back to your point earlier on, that when they're involved in the process, they're actually more engaged. And when I read this, I thought about, you know, I have young children. And when I include them in, you know, even planting a plant or a flower, they feel a, a sense of pride towards that. They kind of look at it. And we all do. I think we all still do. We've all that child inside that still likes that part of being involved in the process. But it'd be great to jump into the 10 elements because, and again, you call this out brilliantly, 10 elements seems like a hell of a lot of stuff, but you're like, <laughs> you have to take them part by part or brick by brick, if you will, and actually build the bridge in a, in a meaningful way. Because you can take on everything at once, but you lay it out into the seven that connect the organization to the people and then the three that underpin and support the bridge itself. Exactly. And I, we will go through them all one by one. But you are right. We did separate them out. And I think one of the biggest problems about engagement are the three that um, underpin and support the bridge. So picture the seven on top and then these other three are holding them up on the bottom. So they're, they're important, but alone they're not going to build the bridge. And these are the things, if you think about what we've been doing, <laughs> I say we again in HR, um, because it's pay and benefits it's workspace and it's well-being. And you think about, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I lived in San Francisco, so I was one of these companies. You know, you throw out all these really fancy things. You know, you're going to have like foosball tables or ping pong tables or you're going to do free food. Or I remember this is probably going back 30 years. At one point in tech companies, they were giving Porsches to their employees to try to attract them. And, you know, these things on their own will not create engagement. They'll make people happy for a little while, you know, the free food and the ping pong. But that sort of goes more to the happiness and not the engagement. And that's why what we're trying to focus on is let's get these seven connectors, these elements right. And then by all means, still do the other three, but don't just do them on their own because it's not going to work. Yeah, and I love you call that out as well. We'll talk about pay benefits in a while because oftentimes people, the old way of thinking is throw more money at people. But we're at a stage in the world where people are looking more towards self-actualization both in the career and outside their career. But it'd be great to jump into the bridge. And the first part you talk about, and this makes total sense, the foundation of the engagement bridge is open and honest communication. It's interesting because I did say that everybody needs to build the bridge in, in the right order or in their own order. But the one area I would make an exception is open and honest communication because you can do everything perfect 
everywhere else. And if you don't have open and honest communication, the bridge will fall down. And this is the bit about explaining the why. So why you're doing something good and bad in an organization, providing feedback mechanisms to have that two-way conversation. It's really, if you think about a relationship, you cannot have a relationship without open and honest communication. And it's just so essential and it's so overlooked. It really is overlooked. And it obviously leads to trust, which is obviously the, the foundation of everything we do in any kind of interaction. You talked about contracts, for example. Our very first meeting with an employee, we have great interview, we might bring them for lunch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the contract arrives and straight away there's a hidden cost to those contracts because we feel, yeah, they're happy with their, their deal, they're happy with their pay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's the finer lines, it's all built against the employee. It is. And, you know, what I really hope that this book does um, is it gets people to take a step back and, and give themselves a critical eye on what they do. And I know it's done it for me. So as we were writing the book, we were doing this, uh, Glenn and I at our company, and we looked at what does our offer letter look like? What do our policies look like? Because if, if you're really honest with yourself, they're built on mistrust. You know, how many rules do we have in some of these, some of our processes and how many rules do we have before you sign a contract? It's, there's some of the most disengaging documents I've ever read. I'm actually getting ready to interview a company. I, I heard them speak in Australia a few months ago and they do their, um, their offer letters, um, their cartoons, <laughs> which just sounds really, really interesting. And I don't think you can ha create too many mistrusting um, policies in cartoons. And I think more companies really need to be refreshing. And again, challenge yourself in everything and say, where's the mistrust that I've built into this? And say, is it really necessary? Can I really be more open and honest with my employees? Or they're not going to trust me, as you just said. I was just thinking, uh, you know, those images where you see two images depending on what way you look at them. <laughs> There's always a way. But um, yeah. yeah, no, it's great because you talk about then ways we can engage the employees because with information to share the information because there's this thing you talk about, the iceberg of ignorance, for example. Yeah, I love that model, and I can't take credit for that. That was, gosh, when 1989, it was a study by Sidney Yoshida. And it's really interesting, and again, it's so logical when you think about it. If you think about an iceberg and you think at the bottom where it's really wide, that's all the information that everybody in your organization knows. They're the eyes and the ears. They're on the shop floor. And as you go up that iceberg, less of the problems, like at the tip with the senior executives, less of those problems are known because they're really sheltered from all of those informations. And the only way that the people higher in the iceberg um, know the information is have the trust so the people at the bottom will feel comfortable enough to, to share it. And I've been speaking to lots of rebels who are really starting to break down those divides and create feedback mechanisms so that they can know what's going on in their organization. HSBC does a great one we talk about in the book. It's called the... Um, it's a more formal name for it, but the informal name of it is the Shut Up and Listen program. And I love it because it's employee, <laughs> employees talking to managers and managers have to shut up and listen. Yeah, which is always difficult because there's a certain <laughs> amount of information management as well up the chain because people don't want you to give too much information. And it's almost like, you, and you talk about this, it's very, very hard for a child to lie. It's not in our makeup, but... We learn it through our paradigms or through our understanding of this is the way we need to interact in society. Exactly. And, and not jumping to the end of the book, but when we were writing our conclusion, um, I think it was Glenn who had this epiphany about everything that we've just spent the last two years researching and writing are all the things that we learned as children. And mm. you are right. That is one of them about not lying. Yeah, so and, and it'd be great to give just maybe one example. And you gave a brilliant quote in there by Richard Peepler, the CEO of HBO. The building <laughs> knows the truth. And it's really interesting because it absolutely does. What you do brilliantly in the book is you always then bring in examples. And they're not all your own clients. They're independent clients from across the world or independent best examples or best principles from across the world. One of them I found really interesting was that of Buffer and the absolute mm. transparency of salaries. I'm, I'm sure many people have heard the buffer situation. And sometimes when I tell this at events, people are like, oh, my gosh, I could never do this. But to be honest, that's why we wanted to share these stories, because you might not be able to do everything they do, but you might be able to do some of it. Because what they do is that they are so open and honest and transparent about their communication. 
anybody could see the salary of anyone. So they've got this worksheet, which is on their website. So anybody listening could go and look also. And it tells the names, the salaries, the bonus, the benefits of everybody in the organization. And they do that to just remove the noise. Because if you think about it, how many people and how much time is spent thinking, oh, well, so-and-so makes that and -and so-and-so makes that. and, And you know what? I'm just as important as them. Why did they get that bonus and I didn't? So it gets away from it. Um, but as I said before about being a rebel, you know, it is a tech company. It is, I think, a few hundred people. You know, you might not be able to do that in a big global company, but that doesn't mean you can't take steps to be more transparent. You know, even simple things like, I don't know, explain to people how your pay programs work, what you need to do to get a pay increase, what you need to do to get a bonus, and little by little, add some transparency um, so that you can be bold and rebellious and create this transparency. Yeah, it's brilliant. And, and we won't go into all the examples, there's loads in there, but moving on with the bridge, another the second of the three underpinning foundational stones, I suppose, within it. And this one leads to, you talk about how, how to define an engaged employee, and one of them is understand and believe in the direction of the company. For that to happen, there must be a direction of the company. And you talk about one of the underpinning bridge stones being purpose, mission, and values. It's so important. And, you know, the good news is, is, you know, if I look back 15, 20 years ago, companies didn't have their purpose, mission and values um, spelled out. And now pretty much every company has it, which is fantastic. But to me, what isn't happening is that they're either not creating ones that are truly meaningful. I was writing a blog and I did a bit of analysis. And if I counted how many times the that people use the word integrity, I mean, and teamwork, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but the fact that so many companies have the same values, to me, doesn't mean that it really is defining and differentiating them. And even more important to that, they're not integrating it into what they do. So if you have a a value of, we value our people. So like LinkedIn, one of their values is members first. And you can, they live and breathe that. We've got one example in the book um, from LinkedIn, and we've got another one on our website. And you can tell they put their members first in how they treat their people. So if you're going to have values, you have to align them or your employees, you're going to lose trust just by not doing that. And then the next one you talk about is leadership. But leadership and management often get intertwined and confused, etc., which is actually one of the problems. But it'd be great for, from your experience as well to give an, the example of both of these bricks on the bridge. Yeah, and this was another one of those epiphanies because we had 10 elements of the bridge. And as we were researching and as we were writing, some of them just naturally came together and leadership and management came together. And and the way they do is if you think about it, leadership is what you say and management is what you do. So if you think about your leaders out there, what they're saying in everything they do to their employees, how they're living the values is just so critical. But then if they start doing things that are um, in opposition, then it's going to cause disengagement. And it's not just the people managers, it's your management processes. So back to what I said before, you know, how do you create your policies that align um, with your values and how do you create them to drive um, trust? And I've seen so many management policies out there that, again, just create this divide between people and employees. I mean, travel policies are a perfect example of that. Expense policies. Oh, my gosh, they're nightmares. It's funny, though, when I was reading this, I thought one of the big challenges for leaders is the expectation on them. And I often think of, say, a new football manager comes in and manages any team, NFL, soccer, whatever sport it is, and they're expected to give immediate results. But they need to almost look right to the academy or the future of the business. They need to win the changing room, essentially. They need to win the people, the hearts and minds of people first. But they're often not given that luxury. And it's one of these real gaps in business that it's the old way was leadership was management. It was telling people what to do. But now leadership, and you you give a great quote in the book, that every hour the CEO spends on creating conditions that make engagement more likely is an hour invested in the productivity of the entire workforce. And that absolutely nailed it for me. I think you're so right. And a lot of time when I speak, I say that it's, I don't believe it's managers' faults in most of these situations. As you said, I don't think we've set our managers up for success. If I think about how we select managers and how we develop managers, it's all on the operational side. 
And what we're learning more and more is that the managers need more of the emotional side. They need to be the true leaders and they need to, as you say, they need to inspire people. But we haven't always given our managers the skills to do that. I, I know when I first moved to the UK from the US and I had to manage people, I was told later that I had my team in tears all the time because no one told me how to manage people in the UK. I was managing the way I used, you know, I learned how to in the US, but they didn't teach me the, you know, the softer side of management in a global workforce. Once I learned that I they, I made them cry, I did learn. And <laughs> it, it, it got better from there. You were like, I thought there were tears of happiness. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> when you think about it, it sounds so simple, but we don't invest in teaching people how to be leaders because it's seen like a fluffy cost, you know, and, and soft skills are becoming the new hard skills. Everybody needs them because people have a choice now. We're at a time of high employment, high choice, the gig economy, et cetera, et cetera. And leaders need to almost attract people, the high, the really high potential people to companies. No, you're exactly right. And we do need to start recognizing that we do need to develop them in different ways. And as I said before, we also need to select them differently. So don't necessarily pick the, you know, the best salesperson to be a sales leader because they might just be a good salesperson, which is great, but they might not be that inspirational leader that they need in that role or, or any other function. And likewise, you talk about management, which is the next brick in the bridge. Again, it, there's a failure to onboard management properly in line with the company purpose, mission and values. Exactly. And I think this is one of those ones that it's not necessarily a quick win, but it's a mind shift. And if we can get people to start moving in that direction and, you know, as I said earlier, you know, pick off one policy at a time. So I give everybody, anybody who's listening, I give you a challenge of picking one of your policies and in the next two months, dissecting it, ripping it apart and putting trust and engagement back into it. <laughs> Brilliant, and and send in your send in your uh, your results. <laughs> exactly, come back to Aiden and I, and then yeah, we'll, we'll score you on it. Now, whatever you do is going to be an improvement. I promise you that. Yeah, but it, again, it's leading back to that thing of trust. Again, you sign the contract, you agreed terms, etc. The contract arrives, you see it, it's riddled with jargon and policies, all protecting the company and not the employee. Straight away, trust starts to erode. Jumping along because you talk about. The idea of permanent jobs, jobs for life, the old way of working has totally dissolved. It has. And that's why I think we need to get into these more adult relationships with our employees, because that is true. So as a business evolves and our businesses are changing so quickly, you might not be the right person for the company anymore. And do you know what? That's not bad. And I think in the past we used to, since jobs were for life, we used to say, oh, you know what? That person just can't do it anymore. Oh, they're not performing. But that's not necessarily the case. They're still as good as they were yesterday. It's just the company's moved on. The role has moved on. And it, it's not good for them and it's not good for the company if you don't part ways. So we need to come up with a more adult, mature way of accepting these things and moving on and supporting people. That segues nicely with the next part. So again, even the labels we call ourselves or the labels that are trust upon us. One of them is our job design or a job title. And oftentimes these are just ripped off a shelf, much like the policy documents you talked about. They're they're templates downloaded from the internet or they're copied from somebody else that you searched on LinkedIn and they're disengaged from the actual day to day work of what somebody will be doing. They are and you know if there's one element of the bridge that people are most surprised to see, it is job design. And I think you're right. It's because it's not something that we think about. It's just something that we do. You're right. It's a carbon copy you just cut and paste, you take a couple words here and there. And I think, again, we need to fundamentally take a step back and think about how we designed our jobs to set our people and our businesses up for success. And again, that's another thing that is a, a shift in, in mindset and a shift in approach. I thought it'd be nice to talk about a couple of examples here, because you talk about the case of Atlassian and their ship at hackathons. I thought that was really in, interesting to get people much more engaged in their jobs. It's really exciting because companies like Atlassian and other companies are really putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to innovation in that they're giving people time to do it. So in the past, companies would say, you know, OK, once a year, we'll maybe sit down for an hour and we'll talk innovation. But Atlassian is I mean, there's so many examples of what they do to build innovation into their jobs. And the one of them that you talked about was ship it. 
So they do ship it, which is for 24 hours every single quarter, they get people together and they just brainstorm on what are the things that we can do to, to make our business better. So they do that every quarter. But then in addition to that, they do something called 20% time, which my company has already started doing, which I love about the book. Someone will read a play and think, oh, I love it. I'm going to start doing it. So we've been testing it, which is every single week, 20% of the time, you take a step away from your desk, away from your work. And again, you think about how you can do things better. And you know, if you think about companies that are going to actually be successful, they have to have innovation built into their jobs and built into their time. So I love, you know, talking to people like Edlassi and we actually just put a, um, a video interview that I did with um, Dominic Price, who um, I love his job title at Lassie and his title is head of R and D and work futurist. And he is so inspiring. If you look at me in the interview, I'm just sitting there in awe of this <laughs> man. It doesn't help that he's about six, five and I'm five feet, but I'm looking up at him the whole time thinking this is amazing. Keep talking. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and it, it, it really links nicely with the next brick, which is learning, because this is something, again, your 20% time, you know, I find a lot of people, they are exhausted in work, they're exhausted by their work load, and then they end up bringing it home. And it may need some efficiencies, it may need engagement, you talk about the bridge, it may need to be implemented. But also, they don't have the time to read because yeah. they're actually going, well, I have to read that report for work. I have to read that white paper, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't have any inputs in order for innovation to become an output. And I thought this was really interesting. Again, the brilliant, brilliant Einstein quote, life is like a bicycle. You must keep moving. Yeah. No, I agree completely. And I, I, I think this is where engagement goes two ways. And it's, I, personally, I think engagement is not just the company. It's the employee also. So an employee probably knows better than their manager. What are the areas that they need to learn? They know themselves better than anyone. So the first thing is to create that culture of constant learning and then to work with their manager to say, OK, this is what I need to do. So I know for me, I start every day out reading and listening, I listened to your podcast, one of your podcasts this morning, and constantly learning. But that's what I do. And everybody needs to work to figure out how can they best learn and what is the best way to help them so they can be the best they can in their job. The next part is recognition. People may go above and beyond, and we tend to throw more money at them or a gift card, etc. And we look at the mechanical parts of recognition rather than looking at the humanic parts, the human side of it, because mm. that sometimes can be way more powerful. Definitely. And I forgot to mention that these last three elements of the bridge that we've just spoken about, we pull them together. Um, and I'll explain how recognition fits into it. So if you think about a job, first you need to design an engaging job. But if, then, if you don't give them learning, then they're never going to get better. And then, as you mentioned, recognition. If you don't recognize someone and you know recognize them for their efforts, even if in some situations if they failed, you know, you still should be letting people know what is working, what is not working. And just think about how you feel when you're recognized. It's just such a meaningful thing. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be financial. Uh, we did a survey and said that 72 percent of people would say that a thank you is enough to make them feel appreciated and recognized for their efforts. So, again, it doesn't always have to cost a lot of money, but it's just so essential and it's so easy to do. <laughs> there is a lot of money spent on it. You tell us $46 billion per year is spent on recognition, but half the employees don't even know there's a recognition program in place. Well, half of them don't know. And then also, I did a talk and I was a magician. I was Deborah the Magician because of the $46 billion in the same study, 87% of it is spent on long service awards. So if you think about it, someone every 5, 10, 15 years is thanking you. I don't think it's the right place that we should be spending our money. I got my magician's wand out and I said, this is how we're making our recognition money disappear because 87% <laughs> is spent on that. But then you take the same survey, you flip the numbers around, 78% of people don't feel recognized. And again, I wonder why they don't feel recognized. I always joke, I say, if my husband said he loved me every five years, I'd leave and that's what our employees are going to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and leading nicely into tenure recognition, because tenure recognition is almost, oh, well, it's that time of year again, or it's that time, you know, five years later, rather than you went above and beyond 
or your thinking was excellent. I know what you did for that client or for that customer. Amazing. And and that impromptu kind of random rewards can be so much more effective. Absolutely. We need to have in place mechanisms for continuous recognition. You know, I had somebody who um, I was writing blog, a blog, I ran out of time and she did a brilliant job helping me finish it. All I did was go online, send her an e-card and thank her. I mean, how hard was it for me to do something like that? Um, but yet, it, you know, I'm sure it, it made her day, her hour, whatever, um, and how she felt by me sending that to her. You tell us there's three ways we can make a change, and this would be really useful for anybody to, I mean, this is a great way to, to start. Yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots of ways, but just a couple of the, the three that we mentioned are with visibility. So if you think about recognition, there's it, it goes two ways. First of all, it makes the individual feel great, but it also showcases um, what good looks like. So I always talk about, you know, like you get an Olympic medal, which feels great, but if you don't have that visibility of standing on the podium and everybody, all your peers seeing what a great job, you've sort of missed half of that excitement. So you need to think about how to make it more visible um, and related to that, you need to educate people on why it's important because it's not natural. I don't know why, but it's not natural. You know, people say thank you all the time, but they don't think of taking the extra minute to recognize someone. And, you know, again, it doesn't have to be financial. We had Dr. Paul White on the show before, and, and he's written a book with Gary Chapman all about the ways we can communicate appreciation and thanks. And he talked about this, that Oftentimes, somebody does not want to be thanked by giving an award in front of all their peers. It actually yeah. drives them the opposite way. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I was doing, um, we in the middle of writing the book, I was revising and updating our recognition program. And I went around the world. And, and in one of the countries, that was exactly what I, they, what I heard from them. They, I said, why aren't, you, why aren't you using the recognition program? And they said they were uncomfortable with it. So I know for ours and other programs, you can actually click a switch that says that you don't want it to be visible. Because you do need to respect that everybody is 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 different, and some people, you know, might not want to be recognized in the same way. But you still want to be able to recognize them. I'm going to have to listen to that podcast. It sounds yeah, really good. I'll send it on to you. The next one is a real juicy one because we talked earlier on about Buffer, for example, posting mm -hmm. employee salaries uh, transparently, and it's this one is a really tricky one. So it's one that's kind of taboo, talking about pay and benefits. And I thought a great way to start this would be the brilliant monkey and cucumber experiment. Oh, I love it. So anybody who's listening, just Google monkey and cucumber. It's the funniest video I've ever seen. It's basically you have these two monkeys who um, the experiment is that if they give the scientist a rock, they get a cucumber. But then all of a sudden, the one monkey starts getting a grape instead of a cucumber. And um, what the monkey does, should I ruin the surprise or should I tell? Oh, yeah. No, let's share. So. Tell? Okay. All right. <laughs> it's funny when you watch it, so it's okay. So when the one sees the other one getting the grape, what happens is they throw the cucumber at the scientist, and then they start shaking their cage. It's absolutely hilarious. And it's just, you know, forget about the humor for a minute. That's how our employees feel. If all of a sudden they see somebody who's doing the exact same thing, you know, handing the rock to the scientist and one's being recognized, one's being rewarded and the other one isn't, it actually causes more problems than it's worth. And, and I think in our pay programs, similar to when I talked about job design, I think we really need to take a step back. And, and I say we, cause I'm a rewards person. <laughs> so this is, this is my baby, this area of pay and benefits. I think we really need to take a step back and think about what have we done in the design of our, our pay programs? I, I did a talk two weeks ago and I said uh, it was on the four monsters that we've created in our pay programs because I, I, I do think we have. And it's not intentional, but the world's changed and we need to recognize that. We need to take a step back and think how can we design more engaging, more effective pay programs. Yeah, and, and th this really resonated with me because I'm an F on the scarf model, so I'm all <laughs> about fairness, and I'd be like the monkey. I'd be breaking the cage open. <laughs> Trying, yeah, I'm the same way. I know, same yeah, thing. It's amazing, isn't it? And, and let's, w what kind of solutions can people look at? Because this is one I suppose a lot of people will just be, you know, flummoxed by, and they won't know what to do with. Well, I guess the, the, the first thing is just to take a step back and say, are your pay programs fair? And if they're not, and I've been in big, huge global companies before, and I know it's not a simple fix, 
but think about what can you do to make them fair? Because you need them fair before you can be transparent. Because you can't be transparent if it's not fair because you're just going to have problems. So just take a step back and think about are all of them rewarding and recognizing people fairly? So if people are putting in the same amount of contribution, is everybody rewarding, being rewarded in the same way? And little by little, change your programs to, to do that. And then definitely find ways to make it more transparent. Because, you know, again, the world's changed with technology and everything. People are going to find these things out anyway. You know, I've got teenager children who take pictures of every single meal they eat, every single outfit. I wouldn't be surprised when they get their first paychecks. You know, they'll post their paycheck on Instagram. So, you know, whether we like it or not, there, we, we need to move towards transparency. Yeah, and people talk as well. I mean, that's the other thing. And they leave companies and then they'll tell other people what they were on. It's, it's, it's one of these ones that really needs to evolve. The next one I love, one of the reasons... I really like this is because you hear everybody ad nauseum talking about millennials and what millennials want, but there's actually five generations in the workplace today. Yeah. So just as practices need to evolve, so too must with the workspace, not the workplace. Exactly. And you know, I work with about 85% millennials and um, I actually love them. They keep me on my toes. They really do. And then, you know, I think they get a lot of um, bad press. Because I don't think it's their fault. I think it's it's a lot of what people like myself, you know, my generation and, and who have um, created the world that they live in. So no surprise, they have different expectations. But yeah, you are right. We do have five generations and everybody has different ways of working, different ways of thinking. And I also don't think it's just generations. I just think that, you know, you talked about you were a certain personality. We all have different personalities, too. So you could have two people, completely different generations who have different, have similar ways of working. So we just need to look at that as well. We're, we're really selling automation and artificial intelligence here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's different, different generations. We're all, we're all hard to work with. Hire the robots. Uh. No, no, no. But see, that's what I love about work. I, I, you know, maybe it's because I, I took some psychology courses way back when, but I love trying to get into the, you know, the minds of people and trying to figure out ways to work because problems with computers is that they're not going to be able to figure it out and they're going to treat everybody the same. So that's why you need to keep the, the human aspect of it. Absolutely. And, and that leads nicely to being human. One of the things we need to do is keep ourselves human and keep ourselves sane and keep ourselves healthy. And it's one of the top stones of the bridge which is well-being. It is, yeah, and it's actually one of the new ones. So the, the two that we added um, late in the game were workspace, the one we just spoke about, and, and well-being. And we added workspace because we didn't used to think of that as an engagement tool, but it, it really is. I learned a lot about workspace writing the book. And the same thing for well-being. Well-being sort of used to be woven into benefits, but more and more organizations are seeing the huge impact that having um, well-being as a part of their integrated employee engagement strategy is going to make such a difference. And, and not just one element. So we used to think about physical well-being, but now more and more people are thinking about the mental health and also the financial health of our employees. So I think it's a really exciting area of HR and engagement that businesses are starting to embrace. We're in the knowledge economy, so we have to look after people's bodies in order to look after their minds. But then there's the whole halo effect of everything else outside it. And I loved some of the examples you gave, for example, of people getting financial health checks ongoing. And they were almost given plans because it's, again, one of these things. We either have a good mentor or a good parent or somebody in our lives who teaches us financial skills unless we're actually working in that industry or else we don't have them. Yeah, it's interesting. But, you know, I remember, gosh, 20 years ago when people were just starting to talk about supporting the financial well-being and companies were really nervous about it. It's like, that's not my job. That's their parents' job or that's the school. But the problem is, as you said, you know, you have to address the entire person. And if they walk into work stressed out about finances, how are they going to behave to your customers? How are they going to behave to their colleagues? So you really do need to address that whole person and not hide behind a stone thinking that somebody else is going to take care of it. Yeah, and, and you know what I thought was really interesting? You call out some figures because I think some people may feel alone if they're struggling. And you talk that quarter, you know, one in four, 25% of people have a mental health issue. 25% have a physical inactivity issue. 
and 53% stress about finances. I thought that was, they're massive numbers. And that if we're not, if we're not looking after those people, they can't innovate, they can't be at the top of their game, and the company won't move forward as fast as it could. And it's really helpful having those types of stats. I mean, it's not good. I mean, I agree with you completely. It really worries me if I look around and I think in my company, you know, 25% of my people have these problems, 53%. But the numbers are really good because it fuels us and it gives us the ammunition to go out and do something about it. And I'm hoping as more companies get more involved, that those numbers will reduce. I thought I'd share this one because we haven't talked about all the plays, which are the case studies essentially throughout the book. But one of them I thought was very relevant to the show. We have lots of consultants from Accenture and Deloitte and the big top consultancies listen to the show. And you give a great example of what Boston Consulting Group, the BCG Group, do and their PTO model. I have two plays from Boston Consulting Group. That's how committed they are to to well-being. One is in the book, PTO, and then also on our website, we have another thing, uh, another play about all the things they do when it comes to flexible working. But I love PTO because in the U.S., PTO is normally paid time off, and that's what I thought they were talking about. But it's a different type of model, and they were really um, – I thought they were really strategic in what they did. They, they worked with um, – a professor at Harvard Business School, and they looked at what can we really do to um, help people with the whole management of time. So P stands for predictability. So thinking about what can we do so that even though we're consultants, we can predict the types of things that are going to come our way. And the next one is teaming. So what can we do to support each other? Because we know things are going to come at us. We need to help each other. And then one is one is the other one is always oh, communications. And what it did is it freed people up to have more time for themselves, which in consulting is really difficult. But the novel thing they did also is they shared it with their clients and their clients really respected it. I know I would respect a consulting company if they said, we're putting this program in place to make sure that our employees are better to support you. So I think it was really brave and they've had some really, really positive um, success with this program. Yeah, and it's interesting. I I found the P part, the predictability, something Mm. that if you don't actually work in those companies, you're totally oblivious to, which is, where am I going to be next week? What what company I might be in-house, etc. And that must cause a huge amount of stress. But Deborah, in, in, in summary, it'd be great to share your key messages, I suppose, for the industry of which you've been part for such a long time. We need to change. I think we need to stop talking about it, and I think we need to actually take a step back. I've given a couple examples today of how companies can just take a step back, think about what you're doing, be really open and honest with with yourself and assess it. Don't get um, protective over what you're doing. I'm doing that in my company as well, and I do that when I go and meet with people. And just really take a step to be a rebel and find some new ways to do things and and not be afraid to to do this because that is the change that we all need. And where can people find out more, Deborah? You mentioned your blog, you mentioned your interviews, and you mentioned to me as well an upcoming podcast. So um, we've got a website for the book, which is rebelplaybook.com. And on there, we've got some video interviews. As a matter of fact, I think today we're posting one with um, Patty McCord, who was uh, used to be in charge of HR for Netflix and just wrote a new book called Powerful. Um, so we've got video interviews, we've got more plays, because as I said, you know, I'm still on a quest. So if anybody has a great story or play, give me a call. Um, you can also download the first two chapters for free, because we really want people to just, you know, get out there and learn from this. So even if you don't want the book, come to the website, there's lots of free material. Um, I also write lots of blogs um, on my company's website, which is um, rewardgateway.com. So you can get more information um, there. And those are probably the best resources to uh, to find it or just reach out to me. And just to let you know, all of the proceeds from the book is going to a charity. It's our foundation that we're setting up to make the world a better place to work, which is my company's mission statement. So I'm very excited about that. Deborah, it's been brilliant talking to you. Co-author of Build It, the rebel playbook for world-class employee engagement. Deborah Corey, thanks for joining us. Thank you.